Disclaimer. REN Technology Services is registered in the BVI. We are a consultancy firm that provides technology services. This video, voiceover, is a true translation of the British Virgin Islands Commission of Inquiry Report of the Commissioner the Right Honourable SIR Gary Hickenbottom. Presented to His Excellency John James Rankin CMG the Governor of the Virgin Islands April 4, 2022. None of the text from the report was changed and was transcribed as reported by the Commissioner. The purpose of the translation is to make sure that the general public would have the full opportunity to hear the text as it is presented in the report. REN Technology Services or its owner has no political affiliation or would ever collaborate with any political group to mislead the public. Please notify us if there is an issue with the transcription. Chapter 5 Assistance Grants Assistance Grants the BVI has a welfare benefits scheme, administered by the Social Development Department within the Ministry of Health and Social Development. However, in addition to that scheme, money is made available for distribution by members of the House of Assembly and Ministries by way of discretionary assistance grants. During the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the money being available for such grants being increased, grants were also made available through a number of programs designed to assist with the economic consequences of the virus and the lockdowns and other restrictions imposed to combat it. In this chapter, I look at how these grants have been made and administered. Introduction 5.1 The BVI has both a welfare benefits system and a social security scheme. 5.2 The Social Development Department, the SDD, within the Ministry of Health and Social Development, the MHSD, has described itself as a compassionate, accountable and responsive organization that will effectively and efficiently deliver the highest level of social services and improve the quality of life of every resident and citizen of the BDI. It administers the Public Assistance Program, which provides a wide cadre of services to meet the holistic needs of its service population. One. Under the scheme, following appropriate assessments, assistance can be provided for, amongst other things, medical needs, medical equipment and pharmaceutical needs, emergency food relief, housing repairs, utilities, burial costs and daycare, and can also be provided in the form of monthly financial or food grants. Assistance is granted following an evaluation of income, expenditure and assets, and any required assessments of need from e.g., social workers. The Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Agriculture and Fisheries II, the MEC, administers a separate program which provides miscellaneous grants to students and educational organizations and committees. 5.3 The Social Security Act 19794 established a Social Security Fund to be administered by a Social Security Board, the SSB, under the portfolio of the then Minister for Health and Social Services 5. There are several sources of funds but generally Social Security works as a compulsory insurance plan to which employers, employees, self-employed and voluntary contributors make contributions, largely governed by the Social Security, Contributions, Regulations 1980, and insured persons are protected from financial distress by way of partial income replacement when certain contingencies arise, e.g. sickness, maternity, employment injury, invalidity surviving the death of an insured person and Becoming 65 years of age, largely governed by the Social Security, Benefits, Regulations, 1980. The board is responsible for the management of the organization, but the Act specifically charges a director with the responsibility for the management of the fund, in particular the collection of the contributions and the payment of benefits. In June 2020, the BDI government announced a COVID-19 unemployment-slash-underemployment benefit for those who had been in insurable employment for at least a year and had been financially impacted by COVID-19, calculated at 50% of insurable earnings up to a maximum of $1,000, and a minimum of $500 a month, for a maximum period of three months. 5.4. However, in addition to these programs, money is made available for distribution by members of the House of Assembly and Ministries by way of discretionary assistance grants. Further, during the COVID-19 pandemic, grants have been made available through various new programs. This chapter of the report considers the governance and propriety of these grants. House of Assembly Members Assistance Grants The Scope of the Grants and Process 
5.5, since 1997 each member of the House of Assembly, until 2007, the Legislative Council, has received an annual sum for distribution. Initially, the money was distributed to cover the cost of minor district-slash-territorial projects submitted by elected members, but it is now used by members to provide a wide variety of financial assistance to individuals and organizations and, by some, to finance constituency offices. 5.6. The House of Assembly makes an annual supply vote in respect of these grants, and that sum is then appropriated out of the consolidated fund. The amount has varied over time. It was initially $60,000 per district member and $75,000 per territorial member, but the usual allocation is currently $125,000 per district member and $150,000 per territorial member, i.e. a total allocation of $1.725 million. However, the Cabinet may approve additional amounts in respect of assistance grants during the year by way of a supplementary appropriation, which is then approved by the House of Assembly in a Supplemental Appropriation Act 10. A supplementary appropriation can be made before or after the money has, in fact, been spent 11. In 2019, an election year, the newly elected government allocated $2,741,610 for assistance grants, which exceeded the normal initial allotment of $1,725,000 by just over $1 million. In November 2020, an additional $100,000 was given to each member to help with the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic 13. In 2020, the BVI government allocated a total of $6,974,663 to members, including £3.9 million exceptional allocation for coronavirus prevent EXP 14. 5.7 The grants are administered through the Clerk of the House of Assembly, as the relevant accounting officer, she is responsible for funds that are dispersed by, or on behalf of, the House of Assembly and its members acting as such 15. The allocation is released by the Treasury Department, i.e. available for spend, in four equal quarterly lot 16. 5.8 Having received an application, a member will decide whether to use the funds allocated and available to him or her to meet the request in whole or in part. Insofar as he or she decides to make a grant, the member then sends the application with any supporting documents to the clerk of the house as the relevant accounting officer. He or she considers the application and ensures that the documentation is complete 17. The application is then passed to the Accounts Department via the Deputy Clerk. The clerk accesses the allocated monies by issuing a purchase order under the PFMR 18, which he or she sends to the Treasury Department with a voucher, which he or she issues and signs off, and any supporting documents requesting payment to the applicant. Neither the Ministry nor the Treasury Department approves the Purchase Orders 19, the Accountant General, who heads the Treasury Department, or someone on her behalf, simply issues a check payable to the applicant, which is sent to the applicant via the clerk and the relevant member. 5.9 Members of the House who gave evidence to the COI accepted that governance in respect of this program was restricted to the checks made by Clerk of the House and the Treasury Department 20. There is no requirement, on individual members or otherwise, to disclose to whom, or otherwise how, the funds are distributed, and, in practice, records are not kept, and, certainly, records are not kept that would enable a full audit to be performed. 5.10 A set of guidelines has been used since at least 200621. These are scant. In short, they 7. Prohibit assistance being given to the member himself or herself, spouse, parents, offspring and their spouses, and siblings and their spouses, any company in which the member has a majority interest, any organization not registered in the BDI or for projects outside the BDI where there is no BD Islander as a beneficiary, or members of staff of the House of Assembly 22. 8. Require the setting up of a tracking system by the Clerk of the House to track duplicate requests 23. 9. Require the lodging of a completed application form with the Clerk of the House for consideration under the head and subhead of estimates approved by the Legislative Council, now, of course, the House of Assembly, and within the guidelines themselves, with the Clerk to inform the member in writing of any further information required 24. 
X, require supporting documents with each application, with specific documentation for financial, education and medical assistance, respectively 25, 11, limit grants of monthly living allowance to $400, with a request that serious consideration be given to liaison with the SDD to ensure that, e.g., a person is not left without any assistance in the event of a change of administration 26. 12. Allow district office expenses of up to $24,000 for rent, staff and operating costs 27, and 13. Allow district projects, apparently the original purpose, subject to those valued at over $7,000 being accompanied by bills of quantities approved by the Public Works Department, the PWD, 28. 5.11. Whilst an applicant is able to apply to any district or territorial member, the overwhelming focus is upon a member giving assistance to his or her constituents, so most successful applications are those made to the member in whose district the applicant resides or to a territorial member. As the clerk of the house put it, t, he funds are placed there for members to assist their constituents where they can, 29. 5.12, on the evidence given by members to the COI, within the very wide discretion they are given to distribute the funds, it is clear, but unsurprising, that the approach is not consistent. Some referred to the burden placed on them to choose appropriate beneficiaries given the number of applicants and the amounts they seek, far greater than the money available, the width of the available discretion and the very limited guidance 30. Most have a particular, personal focus to the grants they give 31 but the examples provided show the wide, almost limitless, nature of the recipients and their requests 32. In respect of the distribution of these grants, the discretion afforded to members is, for all intents and purposes, unfettered. The 2009 IAD Report 5.13 In May 2009, the IAD, then the Internal Audit Unit, produced an audit report in respect of the assistance grants made by members of the House of Assembly for the period 2006 to 200,833. The report had the following objectives. 5.1. To determine and define the purpose of the assistance grant program. 5.2. To give assurance to the adequacy of the control systems in place to safeguard the program from abusive practices. 5.3, to identify area or purpose for which the program funds are most widely used. 5.4, to identify and assess the adequacy of the process of distributing funds from the program. 5.14, the main conclusions of the IAD report were as follows. I, in terms of purpose, the IAD report said. Based on the assistance offered by already established programs, the audit team is at a loss as to what necessitated the evolution of this program from its original intent of facilitating minor district projects, to one whereby elected members are solely responsible for deciding who is granted funds from the program. 34. Other government agencies administered assistance programs that were more objective and transparent. 35. In response to the question as to whether the scheme for members' grants had simply evolved slash changed without any real guidelines or criteria or review of what its purpose was, the IAD director said, it was dramatically so, yes. That was the situation, 36. 2. The guidelines, as agreed by the members of the House, referred to above 37, were grossly inadequate and therefore difficult to enforce, contradictory, and vague in most instances. As a result, necessary controls to ensure transparency and consistency within the program are deficient 38, and, in any event, I, N, the majority of cases, the guidelines are not enforced 39. 3. Although the guidelines required substantiating documentation, in most instances requests were not substantiated 40. Of a sample of 2,912 applications, only 169 were found to have supporting documentation sufficient to justify the request 41. 4. There were examples of unrestrained use of the funds by members, i.e. it was down to each individual member to interpret the guidelines and use their discretion as to whether they would award a grant or not 42. In terms of amounts granted. The manner in which assistance is granted to applicants appears to be very subjective, in that it is not clear how representatives determine the amount to be awarded to applicants requesting assistance. In short, I.T. is the discretion of the member, 
to determine if the person will receive and how much the person will receive. It's at the member's discretion 43. V. The Clerk of the House of Assembly was the relevant accounting officer 44. However, she played no part in ensuring that the money was used properly 45. As the IAD report put at 46. The clerk is the accounting officer for the House of Assembly. However, the clerk lacks the necessary authority to make expenditure from this subhead without the express consent of the elected representative. This begs the question, as the accounting officer for the House of Assembly, where does the clerk's responsibility and accountability end? The IAD clearly considered that, in practice, the express consent of the member was both necessary and sufficient for payment to be made 47. The report concluded that it had become the norm for members of the House to approve requests without there being any real role for the clerk of the House, the clerk could not question approvals and the IAD director considered that it was important that the clerk understood his or her role as accounting officer as prescribed by the PFMA regime and remained accountable for the funds for which he or she is entrusted as the relevant accounting officer. The clerk was placed in an impossible position because, as accounting officer, she was accountable for the payments made, but, in practice, she was unable to question any payment which a member required to be paid 48. 6. The budget for this subhead was determined by members of the House of Assembly, there was no discernible correlation between funding and needs 49, e.g. by reference to historical trends. It was simply driven by the current administration's wishes. N. E. E. D. isn't brought into the picture. 50. 5.15. The IAD report recommended that consideration be given to transferring the funding for this program to agencies which had already established assistance programs that would be able to give the necessary level of transparency and consistency, with an appropriate distinct budget prepared for this program with a view to it returning to its original purpose. 51. 5.16. As shorter-term measures, eight further recommendations were made 52, including, it is recommended that the present guidelines be revised by an independent body to eliminate any inconsistencies which may exist. It is further recommended that such guidelines be formally adopted by Cabinet to better regulate the use of this subhead in the long-term 53. 5.17, the overall conclusions of the report were, in terms of governance, excoriatory. 9.1 The assistance grant program facilitated by the House of Assembly may prove to be a very effective tool in executing small district projects as originally intended. However, in its present state, the program does little to develop the district but serves to provide general financial assistance to individuals for varied purposes. The program is largely administered based on the individual will of elected officials. Being such, the need for accountability and transparency is greatly heightened. In its present state, this program is void of an adequate control framework, which leaves the program susceptible to abusive and fraudulent practices by both applicants and elected officials. 9.2 The funds disbursed from the assistance grants program form a part of government's budget each year, therefore any expenditure from this subhead must maintain the same level of documentary evidence as any other expenditure and must be accounted for in the same manner as expenditure for other subheads as per Public Finance Management Regulations 2005. As a matter of fact, because elected members are the sole determinants as to who is rewarded from this subhead, the level of accountability and transparency must be augmented to do away with any perception of malfeasance or impropriety. As it now stands, the manner in which the program is administered leaves room for much speculation and possible incorrect perceptions about the program. If one was to review the documentation on which assistance is given and hold it against the most liberal of standards for transparency and objectivity, it would fail miserably. As a result, one can perceive the program as one to provide legitimate assistance to constituency or equally a program to compensate cronies and voters for their support and also to win over the electorate for the next election. Such perception left unchecked can seriously undermine the program, as well as the government. This made clear that, in the view of the IAD, the level of governance in respect of these grants was minimal so that they were susceptible to abusive and fraudulent practices by both applicants and elected officials, with the result that, although the grants could provide legitimate assistance to constituency, 
They could equally be perceived as a program to compensate cronies and voters for their support and also to win over the electorate for the next election, 54. Of course, in the absence of any sensible checks or records, it was impossible for the IAD to say whether particular grants were, in fact, dishonestly claimed and slash or distributed. 5.18, the management response from the clerk, on behalf of the House of Assembly 55, recognized the seriousness of the issues raised by the IAD report. Whilst it did not agree to the recommendation that the relevant funds be transferred to programs with established transparent and open procedures, it did agree that clearly defined guidelines that would allow for transparency and consistency in administering the funds must be developed and implemented. Also, allowing monitoring to be done consistently and transparently. It was also agreed that an independent body would be set up to redraft the guidelines. That was all to be done by the Clerk of the House, with an expected completion date of 10 months 56. 5.19, the Clerk of the House, therefore, appears to have appreciated the validity of the serious concerns raised in the IAD report, including the inherent risk of abuse and fraud given the manner in which the grants were distributed. However, when the clerk raised these issues at an informal meeting of the members of the House of Assembly, she said that the members were unwilling to reform the program as the IAD report recommended, or, it seems, at all. The members regarded the money allocated to each of them as their money, the clerk said the response by members was, e, then though she's the accounting officer responsible for the funds, the clerk does not dictate what I do with my money 57. Glenroy Forbes 58 said that, during his time as financial secretary, he encouraged members of the House of Assembly to set up better guidelines as to how this money should be dispersed, but without any reform of the guidelines being instigated 59. 5.20 There was a follow-up report by the IAD in March 201160, which reported that, of the 10 recommendations in the earlier report, none had been implemented. The only reason given was that addressing the weaknesses in the current guidelines has not been accomplished due to lack of cooperation from some members of the Assembly 61. As the report said, such an environment increases the likelihood of impropriety 62. 5.21 The follow-up report pressed hard, in the form of a renewed high recommendation, for the recommendations provided in the original report to be implemented expeditiously 63. Other recommendations in this further report included i. That the Clerk of the House establish documentation standards and requirements, and that a system be put in place to verify the information provided by an applicant 64, and 2. That, in respect of the Clerk's position, a. The Clerk be guided in her role as accounting officer by the relevant provisions of the PFMA and the PFMR 65, and b. The advice of the Attorney General be sought in respect of the apparent conflict that exists where the Clerk of the House as accounting officer does not, in practice, have authority over the Assistance Grants Fund 66, attention which the Clerk herself appreciated 67. 5.22 The then Speaker of the House of Assembly, Honroy Harrigan, responded to the IAD follow-up report by a letter to the IAD Director Wendell Gaskin, dated May 19, 2011. He expressed concern about the IAD performing an audit of the accounts of the House at all, but, leaving that to one side, the substance of the response was as follows. In 2005, the assistance grant program was expanded to include persons experiencing certain hardships. Along with this expansion, members felt that they have a good idea of what happens in the community. Members reported that they use their discretion to give funds after hearing from the applicants. Furthermore, members said they are at a loss to perceive what mischief is being corrected by the recommendations in the reports. There is general sentiment among members that there is no impropriety as far as they are concerned, ed, and that the assistance grant program is being handled the way they want it done. Thus, the members of the House of Assembly were, at least, insensitive to the lack of governance in respect of these grants of which they were made fully aware by the IAD report. Having been made aware of them, they deliberately closed their eyes to the risks of the dishonest application of grants. 5.23 The IAD director responded by letter dated May 27, 2011, saying that, contrary to the member's assertion that disbursements from the fund are discretionary, this assertion is invalid since disbursements should be guided by the guidelines produced by the House of Assembly. 
The most troubling aspect of your letter is that members believe that the assistance grant program is being handled in the way that they, the members, want it done. We staunchly disagree as the disbursement of public funds is governed by the Public Finance Management Act and regulations. Although the law does not explicitly bind the members of the House, the accounting officer for the House of Assembly, who approves the disbursements, is bound by the standards set forth therein. He concluded, in closing, it would be enlightening to know what conditions must exist that would warrant an overhaul of the assistance grant program. Would it not be more prudent to correct the issues as identified by being proactive rather than reactive? We hope that this letter is received with the sentiment in which it is sent and that it clarifies any misconception that the members may have as it relates to our authority and to the audit of the assistance grants program. It is our hope that the recommendations provided will now be accepted and implemented. 5.24 There was no further correspondence between them on these issues. 68 the fact that members failed to cooperate with the clerk of the House to address her concerns over the weaknesses in the guidelines meant that the absence of transparency, effective control or other principles of good governance was entrenched into the system 69. 5.25 It remains entrenched. There was no evidence that the way in which the assistance grants are allocated by members of the House of Assembly and are administered has changed since the IAD report. Indeed, despite the COI raising these issues, neither the elected ministers nor the other elected members of the House of Assembly suggested that they were willing to consider any changes or review the way in which these grants are distributed. Concerns 5.26 On the basis of the evidence, assistance grants are distributed by members of the House of Assembly in a legally arbitrary and unlawful manner. There are almost none of the basic rudiments required for a lawful scheme. For example, there is no adequate policy guidance for the exercise of discretion by members of the House in respect of the distribution of grants. As the IAD report concluded, the guidelines that do exist are not published and are clearly inadequate, no one has suggested otherwise, but, in any event, not all members were aware of the guidelines and, for those who were aware of them, the vast majority of members, the guidelines are not always complied with, and, where they are they are applied in different, subjective, ways. No sensible records are kept of the applications, or specifically of the grounds on which an application is made. Many applications are made without adequate supporting documentation. No reasons are given for granting or refusing an application. There is no mechanism for reviewing or otherwise challenging the refusal of an application. The clerk of the House, as accounting officer, is responsible for the public expenditure under the PFMA regime, but is left unable to ensure that the grants are even compliant with the relevant guidance, such as it is, and are for the public good. The lack of records makes the grants largely unauditable, in the sense of checks being made as to how public money has been used. Information is not shared with government departments, which are responsible for other assistance programs. 5.27 Thus, on the evidence, the discretion in members as to whom the recipients are and how much they should receive appears to be effectively unfettered. 5.28 These apparent deficiencies in the scheme are systemic, in the sense that they have been maintained by various administrations over the years, and, although the clerk to the House of Assembly has apparently failed to comply with her PFMA obligations, the deficiencies cannot be said to lie at the door of specific elected public officials. Members of successive houses of assembly and of successive elected governments, knowing of these deficiencies and the risk that they posed, have singularly and quite deliberately failed to address them and have failed even to seek to do so. 5.29 Consequently, the concerns were raised in a COI letter to the Attorney General, dated September 21, 202170, as follows. On the available evidence, it appears that 25. The uses for which elected members have and can award grants are now far outside the program's original intention. 26. The guidelines being applied are not fit for purpose. 27. Elected members have refused to amend or even review the guidelines, despite having had their limitations and deficiencies identified to them. 28. Following the internal auditor's follow-up audit review of 2011, elected members failed to cooperate with the clerk of the House to address her concerns over the weaknesses in the guidelines, 
with the consequence that the absence of effective control or transparency was entrenched into the system. 29. The result is that elected members have in effect complete discretion as to the sums they award and the use to which they put the sums allocated to them. Some elected members have made grants without even appreciating that guidelines exist. Such an approach does not make for consistent or even lawful decision-making. 30. The interests of individual members and the absence of effective guidance means that members may make decisions based on different, including subjective, criteria. Again, that leads to inconsistent and potentially unlawful decision-making. 31. The system does not operate in such a way as to promote accountability and transparency. I. A substantial proportion of grants are made without any or, at least, any sufficient supporting documentation. 2. No records or, at least, no adequate, records of the grants made are kept. 3. No information is provided to the public as to the nature of the grants made by elected members. 4. Information concerning the grants made is not shared with other bodies, for example ministries, responsible for providing assistance. V. Whilst it is possible for an applicant to apply to a member who is not the member for his or her district or a territorial member, in practice, a member overwhelmingly makes grants to his or her constituents. 6. There is no means of appeal against or independent review of the decision of a member to refuse an application for a grant. 32. The system does not require reasons for a refusal or grant to be given. Nor does it incorporate a viable mechanism, for example, a means of appeal, for reviewing the decision-making that leads to a grant being refused. There is therefore no disincentive to arbitrariness. 33. The system does not allow the clerk to the House of Assembly to properly meet her obligations as the relevant accounting officer. In practice, her role and that of her staff, and indeed the Treasury when it issues the check, is limited to reviewing the form of an application and not its merits. Accordingly, the distribution of funds is driven solely by individual elected members. The accounting officer is left in the position where she is stopped or otherwise prevented from acting in accordance with the principles of the Public Finance Management Act. 34. Although each member is granted a fixed amount to distribute for the year, allocated in quarterly tranches, if there is overspend, cabinet can, and does, put forward a supplementary allocation which can be, and invariably is, voted through by the House of Assembly. There is consequently, in practice, no limit to the grants that may be made. 35. The sum available to elected members to distribute in 2019, an election year, was increased substantially. 36. Given the existence of various programs established by the legislature, notably the Social Assistance Fund, which incorporate a proper and justifiable assessment process, there is no rational justification for the continuation for this program. 37. Given the lack of effective guidance, the absence of any effective fetter on the exercise of discretion, the lack of transparency, the lack of a proper audit trail, that members can choose who or what to support, the system lacks sufficient safeguards to prevent abuse. 5.30 The letter emphasized that the overarching concern was not that these related to the actions or decisions of individual members of the House of Assembly, whether past or current, or of individual ministers, whether past or present, but, rather, it related to the system as it has been and is operated. Accordingly, the letter invited the Attorney General, as the legal advisor to the House of Assembly and to government bodies including ministries, to make legal submissions on whether, having regard to the available evidence, it was accepted that the assistance grants program operates in a manner which is legally arbitrary, and, if that proposition was not accepted, then the basis on which it was said that this program is operated in a manner consistent with public law principles. 5.31 5.31 The Attorney General declined the opportunity to make any submissions on these issues. 71. 5.32 Whilst, no doubt, most of the millions of dollars that are distributed in this way go to those whom the responsible member believes are worthy, the lack of governance, including the lack of checks, balances and even records, is very troubling indeed, for the following reasons. 
I, whilst, for some members and in some circumstances, assistance grants are no doubt regarded as fulfilling some need, this, however defined, is not a criterion, when considered, need is always subjectively assessed without consideration of any objective criteria, need is not always obviously present, e.g. in respect of members who use a grant to fund their own office, an applicant does not have to evidence need, and no record is kept at the basis of the application and or why a grant is awarded. Similarly, available wealth, in terms of income and assets, or ability to pay, is not a criterion. There is no guidance as to how these grants fit with assistance programs such as the SDD's Public Assistance Program, which is based on an assessment of need and income slash assets. Whilst I am sensitive to the fact that conditions and circumstances in the BDI might make alternative ways of doing things appropriate, no one has suggested, either to the COI or to the IAD director as part of the IAD report process or follow-up, a reason based on the public interest for allowing elected public officials to distribute public money as they wish by exercising what is tantamount to an unlimited discretion. Indeed, it is difficult to think of any such possible reason. Given the existence of various programs established by the legislature which incorporate proper and justifiable assessment processes, there appears to be no rational justification for the continuation of this program in the way it is currently operating. As I have indicated, the Attorney General declined the opportunity to suggest any possible legal justification. No one else suggested that there is any proper justification. 2. Given the lack of effective guidance, the absence of any effective fetter on the exercise of discretion, so that a member can choose who or what to support and the amount of any support, the lack of any form of openness or transparency and the lack of any monitoring or proper audit trail, the system lacks any real safeguards to prevent abuse. 3. Whilst it is possible for an applicant to apply to a member who is not his or her district member or a territorial member, in practice, a member overwhelmingly makes grants to his or her constituents, i.e. those who have the right to vote for him or her at an election. 4. Although each member is granted a fixed amount to distribute for the year, allocated in quarterly tranches, if there is overspend, the cabinet can, and does, put forward a supplementary allocation, which can be and invariably is, voted through by the House of Assembly 72. There is, consequently, in practice, no limit to the grants that may be made. v. The sum available to elected members to distribute in 2019, an election year, was increased substantially. That was, of course, well before the COVID-19 pandemic began. 6. The Clerk of the House, as accounting officer, has obligations of accountability under the PFMA regime, which she does not, and, in the light of the member's attitude, cannot, fulfill. No one has suggested any good reason for this continuing default, but the members of the House of Assembly, past and present, have put her in an impossible position, because of the imbalance of power in practice between them and her. The clerk has made her wishes known that policy guidance should be adopted if the system is to continue, but she has given up trying to change the current way in which distribution of these grants is made. Sympathize with her as I do, it is clearly arguable that she is acting unlawfully and has been knowingly doing so since at least the 2009 IAD report. However, given my recommendations below as to auditing past grants and ceasing future grants, and the patently difficult position into which she has been placed by members of the House, it is unnecessary for me to draw any definite conclusions in relation to the Clerk of the House, and I draw none. Whether any action against her in the circumstances would be in the public interest is a question I leave to the relevant BDI authorities to consider. 7. The deficiencies in governance, and the corresponding risk of abuse of the system, have been well known to successive Houses of Assembly and elected governments for many years. The 2009 IAD report made both lack of governance and the consequent risks very clear. Even in that knowledge, both members of the House and elected governments, who have a majority, and often a substantial majority, in the House, have persistently and steadfastly refused to take any steps to make assistance grants transparent and open. No argument has been put forward to either the IAD in 2009-11 or to the COI as to any legitimate public benefit that might accrue from the system as it currently stands. It has not been put forward in relation to discretionary assistance. 
grants, but it would not be an argument in favor of the current system that the elected public officials know their constituents or, alternatively, know everyone in the territory. If anything, that is a point against the maintenance of a system reliant on the exercise of unconstrained discretion. 8. On the evidence, the system appears to be clearly unlawful and successive houses of assembly and elected governments have willingly and knowingly allowed it to continue as such. They are aware that, in so doing, the risk of dishonesty by applicants and slash or elected members themselves is vastly increased, and it is highly unlikely that any dishonesty would be detected, given that, I, the clerk of the House of Assembly is denied any opportunity to perform her function under the PFMA regime to ensure proper expenditure of public money, Two there are no other checks of any substance, and, three, the lack of an audit trail means that a full audit of the expenditure is impossible. Nine, whilst again it has not been suggested that this is the case, these grants are not arguably administered as they are because of any lack of capacity within the public service. Indeed, the consistent line taken by members of the House of Assembly, informed of the deficiencies and the risks, is that they wish to continue to distribute money in this way, and by successive elected governments that they wish to maintain this system and take no steps to change it. It has not been suggested, by the elected ministers or anyone else, that these assistance grants should be abandoned, or the process by which they are distributed should be reconsidered slash reviewed in any way. 5.33 Whilst it would be frankly surprising if some of these grants were not dishonestly sought and slash or granted, there is simply nothing to prevent or discourage such conduct, the absence of records etc. alone makes it impossible for me to say that any particular member of the House has been guilty of dishonesty in public office. However, the risk of dishonesty is clear and obvious, it has been, and is well known, to past and current members of the House of Assembly, and they have steadfastly refused to take steps to address that risk. They appear to be content to allow the conditions that give rise to that risk to continue indefinitely. 5.34 That is particularly worrying. On the evidence that has been produced to the COI, no good reason has been put forward, or is apparent, for maintaining the system as it currently operates. However, as the IAD report indicated, one reason why members might wish to maintain this system of distributing money, predominantly to their constituents, is that this is a form of political particularization 73 with money being distributed to reward and or encourage political support. Whilst I hasten to emphasize that this is not a burden of proof point, the fact is that other than the mere assertions of members, there is nothing before me, no evidence, and certainly no compelling evidence, to show that they are not so used, which is, of course, itself a result of a lack of governance procedures. That public money is given to all members, irrespective of party, does not make the unconstrained and unmonitored grants of public money any the less concerning. Public money is allocated for the purpose in the budget by cabinet, as then approved by the House. The system is maintained by an elected government and a House of Assembly, which, particularly in recent years, has been dominated by the elected government. A disproportionate benefit, therefore, accrues to the elected government and its party. 5.35 In the circumstances, it is open to me to find, and I am driven by the evidence to find, that, in relation to these assistance grants, there is information before me that corruption, abuse of office or other serious dishonesty, in relation to elected public officials, may have taken place in recent years, and that the conditions that allowed any such dishonesty have not changed. It is unnecessary for me to identify any particular elected officials in relation to whom such dishonesty may have taken place. 5.36 This consequently falls within paragraph 1 of my terms of reference, and the conditions which allowed the relevant conduct to take place still exist. Unless steps are taken, I consider that those conditions are highly likely to continue indefinitely. As I have indicated, no one has suggested that any such steps will be taken without intervention. Indeed, the evidence is firmly the other way. 5.37 Looking constructively at the future, in my view, there should be a wholesale review of the BVI welfare benefits system. It seems to me that, insofar as these grants are used for welfare purposes, and, whilst many are made to those whom the members consider have some sort of need, some are clearly not made for welfare purposes, 
then it is wrong, in principle, that a significant component of such a system is comprised of grants made by individual elected public officials in their, effectively unconstrained, discretion such that they are not required even to consider the need or available funds of any applicant. 5.38 If and insofar as that review concludes that there is some public benefit to having public funds allocated to local, district projects, then consideration should be given to I, having clear and published criteria by which such potential projects are assessed for public assistance. 2. An open and transparent process for the proper recording, assessment and monitoring of projects, and 3. The assessment and monitoring being made, not by, or just by, elected public officers, but by a panel, including members of the relevant district community. However, steps should also be taken to ensure that current or ongoing grants are not inappropriately interrupted by this proposed recalibration, and that recipients of grants are not unfairly prejudiced by the change of system to one that is more open and transparent. Transitional provisions may be required. 5.39 In the meantime, there appears to be no proper basis for the continuation of discretionary grants by elected public officers in the form they are currently made. I therefore agree with the IAD director that, without prejudice to any new scheme that may take its place following the review I have proposed, these grants should cease forthwith. The funds that have been allocated to such grants can be reallocated to the SDD for distribution, on application, in accordance with its criteria for the distribution of benefits, which it may wish to consider revising, in light of the proposed transfer of funds. The SDD should be able to make an assessment of individuals who claim that immediately to revoke discretionary assistance granted to them in the past by elected political officials would result in particular hardship and or unfairness. 5.40 With regard to past grants, in my view, there should be an independent audit of all grants made by members of the House of Assembly for the last three years. Whilst I appreciate the difficulties of such an audit in circumstances in which there is a dearth of documentation, an independent audit inquiry should enable any further appropriate steps, such as a criminal investigation, to be identified and taken. Government Ministries Assistance Grants 5.41 In addition to the discretionary grants made by members of the House of Assembly as described above, government ministries and departments also make assistance grants. 5.42 These were the subject of a separate IAD audit of the five years to 2014 in a draft report dated August 201475. Five ministries, including the Premier's office, then made such grants, with a total budget of about $3 million per year 76. The objects of the audit were I. To give assurance to the adequacy of control systems in place to safeguard disbursements from abusive practices, and 2. To assess the disbursement process for appropriateness, equity and efficiency. 5.43 The audit conclusions largely reflected those of the earlier audit in respect of the House of Assembly Members Assistance Grants. 5.44 the report found that the purposes of the two types of grant, House of Assembly member and ministerial, coincided, except a ministry's grants were, in most cases, based on the subject matter of that ministry, e.g. the MEC administered assistance for educational and cultural purposes, whilst House of Assembly members' grants encompassed all subjects, including, example, education and culture. For the most part, the report found that there appeared to be clear duplication between the programs. 5.45, it concluded that there were more or less the same inadequacies in the control systems to safeguard against abuse as there were with House of Assembly members' grants, with the unfettered discretion lying with the relevant minister. 9.4, for each of the assistance grants programs reviewed, it was observed that ministers have ultimate authority to approve requests for assistance. Permanent secretaries slash accounting officers, although vested with the responsibility, by law, to manage and account for the funds allocated to the various programs have little to no involvement in the approval or denial of the assistance. Unfortunately, this situation thrusts permanent secretaries in a compromising position whereby they are accountable for funds for which, in essence, they lack the necessary authority to approve or deny expenditure without the minister's approval. This, in turn, misrepresents the role of the accounting officer. 
9.5, the audit revealed that there are no formal procedures in place within the ministries for requesting assistance. Letters are accepted by all ministries to substantiate requests for assistance. However, these letters are generic in nature and provide little documentation slash information to support the request. Some ministries, depending on the request, indicated that they would require individuals to submit additional information. However, this does not occur in all cases and is not mandatory, as was evident from the documentation reviewed. Therefore, the audit could not find any objective basis on which assistance was being approved and denied. 9.12.2 Grant award amounts are determined on a discretionary basis. 9.13 Assistance grants programs are not monitored or evaluated to determine their effectiveness and efficiency. Goals and objectives were not created for any of the programs, and as such, monitoring of their performance in the achievement of such objectives is not conducted. Similarly, no performance measures have been developed, such as processing time, to rate the efficiency of the program. 9.16 From interviews conducted, it was revealed that the amount of assistance to a single applicant is left to the minister's discretion. The minister determines the amount deemed suitable based on the need for the assistance and the amount being requested. It was revealed during testing that some applicants received 100%, 100% of their requests, while others received only 10%, 10% of the amount requested. No criterion was found being used to determine how much assistance would be awarded in response to each request. It was conveyed that at times meetings may be held between the applicant and the minister to assist in understanding and determining an amount to approve in response to a particular request, but no documentation of these meetings was found on the files reviewed. The lack of such information removes transparency and equity with reference to the decisions made. Additionally, the absence of clear standards and criterion in approving assistance grants has the potential for the program to be viewed as unfair and non-transparent. 5.46 In most cases, the IAD director said, there was no documentation to support a request, and so, as to amount, you unilaterally would have the discretion of the minister being applied 80, with the relevant accounting officer, in this case, the relevant permanent secretary, simply receiving an instruction to make payment. In addition, there was no monitoring of repeat applications or of progress. There was no discussion in Cabinet as to how these various types of grant should be administered. 5.47 Furthermore, the discretion was, at times, exercised to circumvent the ministry's own policies. An example is given of a student who failed to maintain an adequate grade point average so his regular scholarship from the ministry was withdrawn, but a request for assistance by Way of a discretionary grant was made and approved in the sum that the student would have received under a scholarship, $9,000, $5.48 The IAD report concluded. 11.1 .1, The assistance grants program administered by various ministries is largely administered at the sole will of the respective minister. In their current state, these programs lack adequate controls to safeguard them against abusive practices, 86. 11.3, these programs provide a necessary support for individuals who may not be able to obtain the services without their assistance. However, ministries need to exercise special care to ensure that the process is fair of biases and provides all eligible persons with the opportunity to obtain the help they require. We are aware that due to the limited availability of funds it will not be possible for government to assist all persons, ensuring that processes are fair, lucid, and that guidelines are in place to guide decision-makers in making decisions and add greater value to the program and its administration will help to ensure that the programs are guarded from abusive and fraudulent practices that can create negative perceptions in the public's eye. 5.49 The draft report was sent to all ministries 87. There was no management response from any of them. There was, at that time, no IAC to seek a response or encourage compliance with the 10. Recommendations Therefore, despite ranging over five ministries, including the Premier's office, this report has been shelved, i.e. it has been left sitting on the shelf 88. 5.50 Glenroy Forbes said that, 
when he returned as financial secretary in 2017, he was aware that concerns had been raised in respect of this grants program, but he could not recall specifics 89. He said that, once the appropriation had been made by the House of Assembly, it was for the MOF to become involved if there was an appearance of misappropriation, i.e. that the funds were being spent for purposes for which they were not intended 90. There is, therefore, theoretically a mechanism by which the MOF can get involved, but there is no evidence that it has ever proactively taken steps, or even considered taking steps, to investigate or enforce this in order to ensure that ministers use the program either consistently or fairly. 5.51. There are therefore, in practice, no checks or balances in respect of the exercise of essentially an unfettered discretion in the hands of relevant ministers to make grants. Concerns. 5.52. The concerns in respect of ministries' assistance grants are essentially the same as those over the House of Assembly members' grants described above 91, notably, i. Grants are ultimately made at the unfettered discretion of the individual minister. 2. The grants are not administered effectively, e.g. little or no evidence is required to substantiate an application, with the consequent risk that the program is open to abuse, and 3. Permanent secretaries are placed in difficulty in terms of fulfilling their obligations as the relevant accounting officers. 5.53. These apparent systemic deficiencies were addressed in the same letter dated September 21, 2021 to the Attorney General, as the legal advisor to the House of Assembly and to the government, which dealt with the deficiencies in the House of Assembly Members Program 92. The attorney was given an opportunity to make submissions on the legality and propriety of the ministry's grants program in the same terms as she was given in relation to the members' program. She declined to make any submissions. 5.54. On the basis of the evidence received, as the IAD report found, there are no formal procedures or criteria in place in respect of these grants, which risks decisions being made on an inconsistent and unlawful basis utilizing variable subjective criteria 94. These awards, too, are ultimately at the unfettered discretion of the individual minister without any sensible internal or external checks or balances to prevent the risk of abuse 95. The inadequate records of these grants make them, too, effectively unauditable. 5.55 For the same reasons as set out above in respect of administration of House of Assembly members' assistance grants, on the evidence, it appears equally clear that the process in respect of the ministerial grants is unlawful, and successive elected governments have willingly and knowingly allowed it to continue as such. They are aware that, in so doing, the risk of dishonesty by applicants and or ministers themselves is increased and, given that grants cannot be sensibly audited, it is unlikely that any dishonesty will be detected. 5.56 Again, the absence of records etc. makes it impossible for me to say that any particular minister has been guilty of dishonesty in public office. However, on the evidence, it is open to me to find, and I do find, that, in relation to ministerial assistance grants, there is information before me that corruption, abuse of office or other serious dishonesty in relation to elected public officials may have taken place in recent years, and that the conditions which allowed that corruption, abuse of office or other serious dishonesty to take place may still exist. 5.57. As for steps which I consider should be taken, these very much coincide with those I have made in relation to the House of Assembly Members' assistance grants. In my view, ministerial grants should form part of the wholesale review of the BVI welfare benefits and grant system to which I have already referred 96. The fact that there has been considerable overlap between the scope of various grants has been something which the IAD pointed out some time ago, particularly in a territory with such a small population as the BVI, available public money for grants should, and can, be considered as a coherent whole. Again, it is wrong in principle that such a system has, as a significant component, grants made by individual ministers in their discretion, such that they are not required even to consider the need or available funds of any applicant. 5.58 The benefits of, e.g., publicly funded scholarships, benefits not only to the individual recipients, but also to the BVI public at large, are obvious. I would fully expect that review to conclude that there is some public benefit to having public funds allocated to grants for educational scholarships, etc. If, and insofar as, it does, then I recommend that consideration be given to, 
I, having clear and published criteria by which applications for such grants are assessed for public assistance, 2. An open and transparent process for the proper recording, assessment and monitoring of applications and grants, and 3. Assessment and monitoring being made, not by, or just by, elected public officers, but by a panel including appropriate members of the community. 5.59 However, steps should also be taken to ensure that current or ongoing grants are not inappropriately interrupted by this proposed recalibration, and that recipients of grants are not unfairly prejudiced in e.g., their education by the change of system to one that is more open and transparent. Transitional provisions may be required. Funds that have been allocated to such grants can be reallocated for distribution through such transitional provisions before any new more permanent system is set up. 5.60. In the meantime, there appears to be no proper basis for the continuation of discretionary grants by elected public officials in the form they are currently made. I, therefore, consider that, without prejudice to any new scheme that may take its place following the review I have proposed and or any transitional provisions, these grants should cease forthwith. 5.61. With regard to past grants, as with House of Assembly Members Assistance Grants, despite the challenges posed by the lack of documents etc., I recommend that there should be an independent audit of all grants made by ministries for the last three years.